because there aren't a lot of pieces traded, a lot of things are about to happen. So uh, knight f3, d4. So here, it depends how white wants to play and how they want the game to go. So sometimes people play d4, and then that quite often goes back into the queen's pawn games. So it could be like a London or a Kali or a queen's gambit. But normally, if somebody plays knight f3 on move one, they want to play some sort of English or ready, like King's Indian attack setup. So a lot of people recently have been going here, but the traditional move, if you play knight f3 first, is the move c4. And this is, you know, known as the ready opening, particularly after e6 and b3. Because even here, in this position, uh, white could still play the move d4, and we're in a queen's gambit. e6... The queen's gambit declined. And remember, like knight f3 and c4, these are sister moves of the queen's gambit. So they, you know, there's a lot of characteristics that are similar when somebody plays knight f3 or c4. Okay, and, and if they, it's, they're just one move away from going straight back into queen's gambit territory. Okay, so b3 though, oh, excuse me. b3. And this is now, I would say, a traditional ready style setup, R-E-T-I, Richard Reddy, knight f3, uh, knight f6, bishop to b2, fianchettoing the bishop, bishop to e7, and here, you know, play varies. Uh, I've dabbled with this a little bit myself, and I've played the move g3 here, leading to a positional game, but Botvinnik played e3, and there's no, nothing wrong with central play. Black castle, bishop to e2, I mean, a modest, it's a very modest approach by white, right? Um, as usual, you know, black needs to figure out, okay, how am I going to get this bishop out? But because white isn't really pressuring black too heavily in the center, uh, black can get that bishop out in a lot of different ways. If I was playing this position as black, uh, I would either play c5 or b6. I would probably play b6. I like to solve my problems as quickly as possible. And since white isn't putting a lot of pressure on my center, you know, I see b6 as being a pretty reasonable move here. When white fianchettos the bishop, there's a lot more pressure on the center in this diagonal, so b6 is not always that easy to pull off. But here b6 followed by bishop to b7, and black's probably fine there. Pawn c6 though, by check over, I don't really like. If you're a robot player, and I know a lot of people are robot players. They're just like, well, I went to Chessable and there was a short and sweet course on the semi-slav. And so every time, no matter what my opponent does, I just play the semi-slav. Then you're going to get bad positions because in the ready, a lot of times this like e6, c6, d5, like this phalanx setup here is just not really needed. It's not necessary. Um, so I don't really like the move c6 by check over. Uh, he could have easily played b6 and bishop to b7 or advanced the pawn to c5 just for a little bit more space. This over defensive move c6, not only does it block the knight from being able to come out, but it also blocks this natural diagonal for the bishop. So, okay, uh, it's not like a losing move or anything, but I think it's a step in the wrong direction. So Bodvinic Castle, I mean, what do you want the man to do? Knight to d7, okay. So black is still not preparing to advance in the center because e5 is covered by two of white's pieces. So knight to c3. And uh, here, uh, e5 is possible, although it's not a one-way street. Although if I was playing black, I would, I would consider greatly the move e5 since given the opportunity. The thing is, in these type of pawn structures... Um, with the knight on d7, if white decides to capture on d5, for example, in this type of structure, black would much rather have his knight on c6. So if I'm playing white here, I'm playing rook to c1, and I'm trying to take advantage of the c file. Since the knight isn't on c6, the c7 square is weak, the, the c file can be penetrated upon, and in the end of the day, these pawns... You know, it's a nice little center there, but white's got very active piece play, 
and play down the C file. You know, knight to B5 needs to be stopped, so black would really probably have to play the move A6 here. Okay, and black does have a little bit of the center, but black's pieces are not exactly the, the best placed. Okay, and, th and that's a small detail in positions like this, where if your knight is committed to D7, when you play E5 in positions like this, then white's reaction is often to capture and, and, uh, and take advantage of the C file, where, you know, black could really even consider at some point trying to do this, but okay, he's got to be careful because the knight's guarding the center. So, okay. So, check over didn't go e5, he went a6, but okay, that's yet another move where we're not developing and, you know, we're giving, we're giving my, uh, white more of what they might want. So, um, okay, so here, Bodvinik chooses a very interesting move. He plays the move knight to d4. So this is a really interesting move that Botvinnik wants. And, I, and I'm not sure how great it is, but he wants... He, so first of all, I would say that the natural move here is d4. Yeah, I would say d4. So Grandmaster Rustemov says in this position, he would play bishop to d6, but I don't know about that. Uh, I mean, what if I play the natural knight to b5 and then queen c2, which would be a standard reaction? I'm assuming bishop to b8, but then queen to c2. Yeah, so, but a6 I think is necessary. So like takes, takes, rook c1, a6. Yeah, something like this. Yeah, and, and, and then, you know, and the game goes on. So, um, so a6 was played, and Botvinnik plays now knight to d4. And the thing about knight to d4 is, it's actually quite an annoying move to me. So, number one, Botvinnik wants to play the move f4. So, here, the natural move is d4. But... And that, and that's, in, at least in, I can see in the database that this is the move most frequently played in this relatively rare position. So, but Botvinnik played the move knight to d4, which isn't even in my database. And I know from the game that one of his ideas is he wants to play the move f4. So he wants to give the bishop on b2 a guided path, a guided diagonal in the center and he wants to secure that with f4 as opposed to d4. d4 would better secure the center, but it would also block the diagonal of the bishop. So a very unique opportunity. Now you might say this, this knight to d4 is a really tempting move. You see that knight in the center and you have pawns that can attack it. So you're like drooling, right? You're like Pavlov's dog, you know? You're like, Ugh, oh my gosh, I just, I have to attack. I have to attack this thing. But... I can say that I don't really see a great way to attack. So if e5, for example, then knight comes into the f5 square, and I imagine that Botvinnik would be very happy about that because he is threatening to win the bishop pair, which is something in the hands of these strong players. And he's, he's, the center has moved, so, you know, there's... Black is a little weak in the center because black doesn't have a lot of development. Black is still behind in development. So, you know, with space comes extra responsibility. You have more space. Your pieces need to be doing their work. C5 may be a little bit more natural. I think Botvinnik wanted to encourage that, though, because it weakens the protection of the center. So maybe he plays something like knight f3, goes back, and then plays in the center now that the D pawn is a little bit less reinforced. Although this is playable. Maybe something like takes, takes, and then uh, b6, bishop to b7. It reminds me of ready style position. Okay. But check over decides to take and then play the move knight to c5, which I don't really like that much. He wants to play e5, 
And he doesn't want to allow the knight to f5. So, you know, he had to move his knight out of the way first. Because again, if black plays e5 to begin with, knight f5 is not a welcome move for not a welcoming move for black. Black does not want to allow this type of thing. You know, to have to run scared with the bishop, white already now because of the last trade has more central control. So yeah. So he plays knight to c5 first. And he wants to play e5. So if, if white isn't paying attention, he'll go e5 and actually have a good game. Because if I'm playing black and it's my move, I would probably go e, uh, e5 and potentially even e4 to lock down some of these light squares. And that doesn't look bad to me. Botvinnik played f4, which is sort of part of the plan anyway. And you can see that black has a bigger center than, or white has a bigger center than black. Black has given away the d-pawn for the flank pawn, and white has more control of the center. And you're like, yeah, yeah, but who cares? So it's, um, but it's important, because as soon as you will see, white begins to take away all of the center squares from black's pieces, but when you're fighting against minor pieces, particularly the knights, your pawns, if your pawns can take control of the central squares from the knights, then the knights are m very inferior to the bishops, particularly in positions with flexible pawn structures. So white has a very flexible pawn structure here. White is not committed at all. I mean, white's pawns are still fluid; they're not fixed, and there's no clear there's no clear central square for these knights. And we're going to see Botvinnik do a really great job of taking away central squares from Black's minor pieces. In addition, because of that central space and the central control, Black, because of some, I would say, a little bit lazy opening play, Chekhover's bishop here does not have a clear way into the game. It will get into the game, but at the moment, there's still some work to do on how to get that bishop into the game. So, well, he starts with queen to c7, which I think is a fine move. Bodvinik really doesn't want e5 to be played. So he plays knight f3, which I actually like. I think knight f3 is a good move. And his central pawn structure remains flexible. And he's really controlling that e5 square as well. Rook to d8. So check over is trying to pressure the central file. Queen to c2. I mean, that's very natural. You get the queen off of the d file. You're controlling the key squares in the position. I, you know, it's normal. I mean, where else would, I mean, you don't want to put the queen in some random place. Queen c2 is good. It connects the rooks, gets off the d file, and the queen is on a nice diagonal. Knight c to d7, and one of Chekhover's ideas here is to play c5, b6, and bishop to b7. Having said that, having said that, that does take some time, and in the meantime, Botvinnik seizes control, more control of the center, and so on. So pawn to d4 was played by Botvinnik, and he's controlling, the I think it's a good move. Pawn to c5, naturally Chekhover needs to counter the center in some way. He's got to, he's got to challenge in some way. Botvinnik plays knight to e5. Now, to me, when I look at this position, a move that I would... And, and this is a pretty standard thing to think about in these type of positions. A move that I would greatly consider here is d5. And it sort of reminds me of a Benoni style position where I play the move d5, right? And let's say you take that, right? And I've got two options here that I would consider. So... Pawn takes d5 is okay, but I don't I don't like the move b5 here. But I would be thinking a little bit more tactically here because my queen is on c2, and I would greatly consider the move knight takes d5. And opening up this bishop and going for some knight to g5 ideas. And I know that seems like a hacker hacker style play, but first of all. Let's say you trade knights with me, which I guess makes sense. Well, I've got some pretty good central control. 
I got my knight off of c3, so this stuff is not really coming with tempo. In the meantime, I've got e4 coming, I've got a big center, I've got attacking chances against the black king. I like this for white. Now, I haven't read Botvinnik's notes about this. I'm sure he considered the move d5. I don't know what, I don't know why he talked himself out of it, but d5 seems like a very imposing move to me and a move that I would like to play. And I would say that if black doesn't take here, white's next move is e4. And if white gets to play the move e4, black is dead. That center is just going to come rolling forward and black is going to be just, it's over. If white can play e4, it's over. There's not even anything to talk about. Okay. White would just be plowing black in that position. But Vinick plays a more conservative move. He doesn't really jump, jump the gun here. He plays the move knight e5 and there's nothing wrong with that. But it doesn't sort of take advantage of the opportunity to play the move d5. Be interesting to see his notes to see what, you know, what he thinks, what he thought about that. Pawn to b6. Trying to develop a light squared bishop. Bishop to d3. So you can see that now white's space, the maneuvering of his pieces, you can start to sense there's a lot of pressure coming toward the black king. And... Things are really about to heat up, and we're going to really have to start looking at, at concrete variations. So Chekhov decides to capture, and of course, Bodvinnik captures back, and then he plays bishop to b7. So I would say that those moves are relatively normal. So first of all, the pawn structure is actually pretty normal for ready opening. Does anyone know what these pawns on semi-open files are called? And I think that that's, you know, this is sort of, um, it's more of a definition type of thing here. So it's pawns on the semi-open files, adjacent pawns in the semi-open files. Those are called, yeah, those are called hanging pawns. Yeah, exactly. And hanging pawns, like pretty much everything in, pretty much everything in chess is, um, it has their pluses and minuses. Okay. It's a good and bad. And it just depends exactly how the game is going to go on whether they are good or bad. So here's the thing. The pawns themselves, the pawns themselves control a lot of squares. So they give white space. So that's a good thing. At the proper moment, if white can advance the pawns, that can further, you know, open up the pieces. I mean, that's pretty normal for for hanging pawns. You want to, at some point, advance the pawns and press forward in the center using those hanging, hanging pawns to break it through the middle. Long term, they can be weak sometimes if, if the opposing side can make them move when it's not exactly the right time. So like, like imagine I could go B5 and let's say white had to play C5, giving up all the central light squares, you know? So because they're not supported by other pawns, they aren't as secure as your usual pawns, right? Like a pawn chain. So they've got their pluses and minuses, but in this position, they've got more advantages. Their advantages right now that white has space and as a consequence of that space, white has great attacking chances against the black king. Now, Christian was suggesting knight takes knight, but I don't think anyone would play knight takes knight. Because if you play knight takes knight, and you allow not only my f-pawn to capture with tempo, but you allow me to drive this important defensive knight away from the f6 square, you allow me to open up my rook, that's a death wish. I mean, if, if black traded knights... This is like, it's for, it's already over. I mean, it's it's over for for straight reasons, like you're losing material. But this is not a type of thing that you would want to do. You hand over the whole center to white. You you help white open up their pieces. So you, no one would do this. That would not be a good move. Remember that as much as you itch 
in a game to want to trade something. Actually, Black Allen, who's in the chat, who I saw yesterday, Miss Brenda's husband, uh, he was he said that one thing that stuck with him during my lectures is that generally speaking, a trade of pieces favors one side more than the other. And this trade definitely favors white more than black. I mean, there's no, not even a question about it. White gets everything and black gets nothing out of this trade. White gets an easier attack on the king because it chases away the knight, an open rook, more central control, like no, no, no advantage in playing that move. So Checkover did the right thing. He played bishop to b7. He needs to develop. Botvinnik wants to keep control of the center. He wants his queen a little bit better placed and played the move queen to e2. Now this move has a lot of different ideas depending on what happens next. So first of all, we could play rook to d1, rook on a to e1, and then you would even have some opportunities like knight takes f7 or pawn to f5. There would be a lot of attacking chances there. In addition, the queen has access to the king side, which may be very important as well, okay? And the queen on e2 offers some support to the c-pawn, should that be needed, but the queen is actually just better placed on e2. So, Botvinnik plays queen to e2, okay? Knight to f8, check over says, you can't get mate with a knight on f8, except you can definitely get mated with a knight on f8, okay? There's I know that it rhymes, so it's cool to say, but you can definitely get mated on, uh, with a knight on f8, okay? So he's trying to protect himself, though. It's a little bit harder, but he's trying to protect himself. Yeah, so here, Botvinnik plays an imaginative move, which doesn't necessarily mean it's the best move, but I like it a lot, and I think that this type of move is something that everyone can sort of like take away from. So, Botvinnik has very strong control of the center. And it's hard for Black, I mean, Black doesn't really have any pawn breaks. There's no way for Black to really chip away at White's center. Black could consider B5, like sacrificing the pawn for some central squares, but that would entail a sacrifice. I would say that a normal move here for white is rook to c1 or rook to e1. Rook on a to c1 or rook on a to e1. That's what I would, that's what I would say. But Botvinnik, he was, he, he's more imaginative, okay? Number one, he sees that this pawn is in danger. However, it's unclear whether that pawn's actually in danger or not. Because let's say I play here. I mean, let's say I play here, okay? And you take this pawn. Well, your rook is not the most secure piece you've ever seen on the d4 square. So I could play the move knight to b5 or knight to d5 and really disturb the piece here. So like knight to b5 forking and then picking up this rook, for example. Now, this isn't a one-way street. This would change the character of the position, but this is good for white. White is up material, white still has attacking prospects, and while the, while the position has changed a little bit, this would still be good for white. Botvinnik doesn't want to change the status quo, and, you know, he doesn't want to play too, too simplistically. He plays a great move, in my opinion. He plays the move knight to d1. I like this move a lot. So, it's not really about protecting this pawn, even though knight to d1 protects the pawn. What it's really about is getting this piece over to the king's side to trade off this very important defensive knight on f6. So, as you will see, Botvinnik in some way wants to go after the king. So, he might go here and here. He might go here, here, and here, but he wants this knight to attack the king. And he's looking at black's position, and he's going, you have no pawn breaks. 
I have the pawn breaks. I control the game. B5 isn't happening, and it's going to take you a while to, to do that. In the meantime, I'm going to go for the attack. That's sort of kind of what happens. Now here, checkover plays a very odd move to me. He plays the move rook a7. That move surprises me. Um, it's a very mysterious move to me. Um, to be honest with you, I don't exactly know why he played it. Uh, if I were playing black, I would be trying to play the move b5. And I would even consider sacking the pawn. I don't, I mean, you know, I would, I would have to consider it a little bit more. But I would consider playing the move b5 as a pawn sacrifice. Should white want to take it. And I would say, you know, go ahead. You can, you can have this pawn. So let's say you take it. I'm not even sure that that's the best. I would take back. And I, in exchange, I get some of your squares. Now, I know that that pawn break as a sacrifice is possible because I've read many positional chess books on hanging pawns where I've seen countless examples of that. And here, I don't actually think white has the inferior game. Because even if white takes here, I think black has enough squares for his pieces to justify the pawn sacrifice. Now, when you sacrifice a pawn, it's always going to be unclear because you cannot see the, you know, you cannot see how it is that your compensation for that pawn amounts to something in the end. But I think this change of pawn structure at the cost of a pawn would be to black's benefit versus sitting there and maintaining the status quo, which is that white has more space, white has all the center, and white has the attack. After the move b5, if white advances the move c5, we get these central light squares, and I'd be very happy about that for black. I mean, positionally speaking. It's still unclear, but I would be happy to I would be happy to get that without any cost to me. Check over play rook a7. I don't really get it. And then Botvinnik just he I don't know if he got it or not. He just sort of went on with what he wanted to do, which was transfer this knight over to the king side, which was the whole point anyway. Queen to b8, and yeah, check over is losing his mind here. Now it's now I kind of get what he wants to do. He might want to exert some pressure on this diagonal, but that's simply too slow considering that white has all the center and like like the development and the rook is on a7, the queen is on b8. So yeah, I mean, you can say that the rook on a7 is guarding f7, but like, I'm sorry, that's just, that's just BS. Like this is just not a good setup for, for white. I mean, for black. Black's pieces are too passive. And it's not clear that F7 is the biggest problem that black has. Black has all these other problems, like development and space and, and like rook A7, queen B8. It's Time is so important in chess, right? You don't have time to do that when you've got nothing, when you've got nothing else, you know, like you, you got to get your pieces in the game. And one thing I think, and I've heard like top level GMs in interviews talk about this, is that one thing that modern players uh, do really well is they defend better. And what that usually means is that before you're able to strangle them to death, like Botvinnik is about to do with, like, get all his pieces in the attack, they sense that it's coming. And so they're more likely to play a pawn sacrifice like b5 to ensure that they don't just get completely whacked right? Like easily. Typically when we say defend better, that usually simply means that they smell trouble coming and they, they, they find ways to extinguish the trouble before it happens. And I tend to agree with that. I think even lower rated players are, have become better at defending against like typical plans. And uh, I think that what the way that check over played here, I don't, I don't see a lot of like IMs and GMs playing that way now. So knight h3 and well, 
Botvinnik has his eyes set on the king side, so he wants to play the move knight, uh, you know, knight to g5. So check over played the move h6, and then one of my favorite things in chess is where your opponent thinks they're stopping you from doing something, but then you just do it anyway. So h6 in an attempt to stop knight to g5, okay? But Botvinnik says, oh, no, 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 no. I am going to play knight to g5 anyway, and now it's on, okay? I dare you to take it. And one of the great things about the classics is they love, love, love to, to accept sacrifices and prove them wrong. So knight to g5 anyway, I love moves like this. Now, remember that the, the thought process of a strong player is never like, okay, in reaction to a threat. Now, this isn't a threat. H6, H6 was designed to say, you're not going knight to g5. You are not going to play knight to g5. That's what h6 says. Now, a strong player, here's what, here's what a strong player does. It's like reverse thinking. It's like stubborn thinking. Oh, you said, it's, you said I'm not going to play knight to g5. So the strong player goes, oh, the first thing I'm thinking about is whether or not I can still play knight to g5. I see that you think you're stopping me from doing that. I get that. That's why you wasted a tempo playing h6 is because you thought that I'm not going to do that. And and I said, and and so Botvinnik's like, but wait a minute, I'm world champion, okay? And I'm, I'm not an amateur thinker, I'm the world champion. So you think I can't go to knight g5, the first thing I'm going to think about is whether I can go knight to g5 anyway. And so he does that. And check over says, all right, listen, man, you're not going to walk all over me. And he plays h takes g5. Christian, a tempo doesn't mean that you have to be attacking something. A tempo is simply a cost of move, cost of time. When you play the move h6 and then the guy goes knight to g5 anyway, you wasted a tempo because you didn't stop what you thought you were stopping. Now in the game, Check over took the knight, which is principled. It's like, but I, I was stopping you from doing that. Okay, but, but okay. It turns out he wasn't. Of course, the idea of this sacrifice is the bishops, the rook, the knight on e5, all the pieces come alive. Now, check over understood that if he moved this knight, if he, if he became a material girl all of a sudden, and he took that knight, and withdrew it. He is toast. He is absolutely toast here. Because in this position, I capture this pawn, and then my next move is here. And that's a problem. A big problem. Oh, I could care less about this rook. When you're attacking, the material is not such a big deal when you're attacking, your, your eyes are on the prize. So queen h5 is such a big problem here. And you're looking at these pieces and you're like, what were you doing over there? Like you were asking for this. What were you doing? So check over says, all right, I didn't see that you're going to play knight to g5 anyway. So you did play knight to g5. I'm going to take that just to sort of make my h6 move look like it made sense, but I am not going to uh, move my knight off of f6. I'll let you have it back to try to shore up some of my weaknesses. Well, Botvinnik was not having that, okay? And here he, I know, you know, like GMs are drooling in these type of positions. When you could easily take the material back, he's like, no, I'm busting you over the head, so I'm just going to keep. I know, I know that you're on your last leg here, so I'm going to try to find the shot. And he plays the move knight takes f7. There we go. Now we're talking. Okay, big move right there. Very big move. Well, the knight is still on pre. The f7 pawn has been captured. The knight is attacking the rook, but more importantly, queen coming into e6 is a big threat. Black's pieces on the queen side are so distant from the action here, you know, 
Black's got 99 problems, and, uh, you know, I don't know, like, what he's going to do about them. Okay, so, check over takes, and here, Botvinnik missteps the move order. And it becomes a game again. Although a very brilliant game. Still. So here, uh, Queen H5 check first, or simply capturing the knight, was better than what he did, but only due to very specific reasons, which is very understandable that neither player understood why the move pawn to g6 was an inaccuracy. Now, in the game, Checkover believed that he had to play the move king to g8. Because he thought, if he goes king to f8, that after queen takes e6, he's a dead man. That he's a dead man. As it turns out, he is not a dead man. Can anyone see, for the first time in Checkover's life, how he's going to use this rook on a7? The one I was talking trash about. And, and by the way, it deserved to be talked trash about. Okay, But the rook on a7, through a series of sacrifices and intermediate moves, can actually come to the rescue of the f7 square. Can you guys see how that may be possible? Yeah, so the first move is knight e5. Now remember that Botvinnik had sacrificed some pieces, so black is giving back to the community to save himself. So knight e5. All right, we take that knight because we reinstate the threat of checkmate on f7. Okay, check over plays the in-between move, bishop to c5 check. The check doesn't stop checkmate, but it postpones it for a move. King moves. And now, bishop takes g2 check. The king must take. And after rook takes d3, this rook is guarding checkmate. And miraculously, black is still in the game. What? This is the beauty of chess. The beauty of chess does not always lie in the moves that actually occurred, but some of the beauty the beauty of chess lies in a lot of times what doesn't happen. Okay? It's like I always tell this story. So my non-chess friends always say, oh by the way, before I tell you this, it looks like that would be a problem until you see this. And now it's black who's who's mating white. which is ridiculous. Now the hunter gets hunted. It's like if the deer pulled out the rifle on the hunter. Doesn't make any sense. It's like sometimes in my, um, my friends, my non-chess friends, they go like, oh, you know, how long does, does your chess game take? Like, let's say I'm at like a world open or I'm at a tournament. And it's like, how long does your chess game take? And I say, you know, I don't know if I'm playing somebody my level, four to six hours. They said four to six hours to play one game? Are you crazy? What are you thinking about, right? That's like absurd to them. And I go, yeah, it sort of is absurd. I probably would have thought that too. But the thing is that the beauty in chess is really like, okay, so when you're taking your time to think about all this stuff, it's always, you're playing through these little games of chess in your head, known as variations, and you're trying to assess them, and you're trying to see how the game is going to go, right? Thank you, Xanth, for the sub. And all those little games, there's a lot of beauty in all those little games that you play in your head, which are variations, and sometimes that beauty is not portrayed based on just the moves that have been played, which is why analyzing games is so important. Because a lot of times, the learning experience is in what didn't happen. You know, whatever that might be. Xanth, thank you again for, for 400 bits. So, 
This was a beautiful position. Uh, in this position, if rook takes f6, rook takes f6 here, I take. And I guess you're saying queen takes, but after this, you're going to run out of checks. And black is up material. Black is up a rook. So you could check again. Then I go here and black is up a rook. It's still scary, but this rook is suddenly like a, like a great piece. Like you could play here and then come here and then my rook blocks. And again, if you play this move, oh, you know, going for checkmate, I hit you on this diagonal again. And again, it's white who loses. So it's a very specific defense. And so Checkover didn't do that. He didn't play king f8 because he thought if he played king f8, that he was dead. And it's understandable that he thought after this the game was over because it looks like you can't stop checkmate. But after a series of clearing moves, check, check, the rook miraculously defends because the bishop is hanging on d3, black wins some material, and I mean, it's just crazy. Beautifully crazy. Okay. Well, one thing, one thing I would say, you know, people say like, okay, what's, like, what's the mark of a stronger chess player? And I said, well, stronger chess players are killer at not dying. They find so many defenses, like you got to win the game a million times, okay? And uh, tenacity is one of the strongest traits of the great chess players, um, particularly those chess players who are better than me. One thing I regularly notice is that they just simply don't like die. Like if I play an expert player, like a 2000 rated player or 2100 rated player, if I have an attack like this, it's over. Like there's no way they're surviving it. If I play a GM or something, they're really good at the analytical side of the game and they're just not going to allow it to go down so easily. Okay. And they're not all about their emotions. Like, oh, my feelings and oh, I was so stressed and my heart was going like 200 beats a minute. Like they're not like that. Okay, they're stone cold. They're just like, okay, what could I possibly do in this position? Is there still a resource left? Is there still something for me to do? And they and they try to find the best possible way to go. You know, it doesn't mean that they always save the game, but they do a hell of a job saving games. Okay, so check over play king to g8, but this changes the game because now after queen takes e6, check king h8. Here comes Botvinnik. Bishop to, bishop to f5. Great move. Because now there's a major threat. Bishop to e6 check. King f8. And queen h8. Mate. Because the knight is pinned. Would be pinned. So. Check over play knight f6. Uh, sorry. Knight f8. And bishop e6 was played. Knight takes. Queen takes. Now the king has to go back to h8. Cannot go to f8 because of that checkmate. So king goes to h8, Bodvinik comes back to h3 check, king to g8, and now crushes him, mating attack. Beautiful. The knight on f6, I tell you, you see, if you only listen to me, and you're like, you're not a GM like my other favorite streamers, so I'm not going to listen to you, but I'm still listening, but I'm not going to listen to you. If you just listen to me, and you, and you picked up on the things that I repeat all the time in every single lecture ever, you said the knight on f6 is the key defender around the castled king. Always. So he goes, whack, rook takes f6, give me that. I don't care about the material. I'm taking your knight off of f6. You're allowing me, I'm, I'm getting in those squares and it's gonna be over. Okay, so bishop takes is the only move if you're gonna take, because if you take with the pawn, that's a checkmate in two moves in multiple ways. So you could even get lucky. You would, you would find that. Bishop takes f6 was played. Now, there's no other move because queen h7 is mate if you let the rook live. So bishop takes. Okay, queen h7. 
King F8, and I love this move right here. I love this move right here. What are you guys playing as white here? You tell me. What are you playing? The correct and only winning move is rook to e1. Boom. Rook e1, stopping the king's escape, or at least attempting to stop the king's escape to the e-file, threatening queen h8 checkmate. Now, let's look at let's look at bishop to a3 as some of you were suggesting. Bishop to a3 check looks like it gets a piece into the game, but after king to e8, it's black who's winning. The king escapes. And white is down too many pieces to pursue the attack here. The king will escape. Which is just so annoying. And the queen on h7 is starting to look a little lost if the king escapes to the queen side. So rook to e1, does anyone know what this type of move is called in an attack? Where you play a move that's not a check or a capture? Because you're looking for checks and captures when you're attacking. But when you play a move like this, controlling the king, what type of move is that called? Dunder Mifflin says epic move, but not epic move. It is an epic move, but it's got a real name. It's got a chess name. Yes, I see some of you are saying silent move or quiet move. That's right. So quiet move, it is a move that's not a check or a capture, but it's a move you play in an attack. It's like it's almost like you're like, oh, no, wait a minute. Let me get another piece into the game. But it is a crazy good move, a crazy good attacking move because we're threatening checkmate. Not with the rook per se. The rook is cutting off the king. We're threatening checkmate with the queen. Here, check over tries a little something something. He plays bishop to e5. He says, you're going to have to, you're going to have to mate me world champion, Bodvinik. And he says, dude, I've mated people like you my whole life. That's how I became the world champion. This is now, this is Botvinik's version of Chuck E. Cheese. He's just, he's, a, he's jumping in the ball pit right here. She's so excited about just checkmating this guy. So he checks. The king comes up to e7. He uses the pin. This is attacking, you know, the fact that the pin piece cannot move. And now the king's just getting completely clobbered. Queen takes e5 check. If the king goes back to d7, it's not like this is going to help that much. But it's still, it actually transposes into the game, basically. So queen f5 here and here is, is the game. Well, sort of. We're going to see. So in the game, yeah, 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 yeah. King d7 happened in the game. But queen c, king c6 instead also transposes. Okay. So king d7, queen f5. No, it's not made in two. It's not made in two because here the, the rook can block. Or the queen. Black is dead no matter what, though. But Botvinnik, of course, world champion, found the like the best way to play. Queen f5 check. King c6. D5. We got a beautiful king hunt going on here. Here comes the king. Bishop a3 check. Here comes the poor king. Oh, no. You don't want your king leading your army like this. Okay? Not with all these pieces on the board. So here comes, here comes Bodvinik about to seal the deal. Here we go. Many, many roads lead to Athens here. He chooses one of them. Also, there were multiple mates there. McQueen to be one checkmate. So crushing game by Bodvinik. Uh, I love that game a lot. The one beautiful part of this game was that there was one moment in this wonderfully sacrificial game where Checkover actually had a defense. No, he didn't resign. According to my notation, the game was played until mate. I think that that's out of respect that Checkover had for Botvinnik to allow the game to finish in the in checkmate because um, it was it's just such a great attacking game. One of the most beautiful moments was the defensive moment here. Checkover almost surely thought he was a goner after king f8 because of queen takes e6, threatening checkmate. So he played king to g8 and allowed Botvinnik all of the tempo gaining attacking moves, capturing the pawn with check and so on. It was beautiful to see 
that there was a defense here with the move knight to e5. Finally using this rook on a7 for the good. And this line of play, check and check. This is so beautiful to me that this was a defense. And it actually, in this position, black is, according to the computer, black is actually winning here. So in this position, here, uh, Botvinnik's best move is the even more sacrificial rook takes f6 check. If bishop takes f6, then there's bishop a3, which ends the game. So the pawn must take, then g7 check. And this is how the computer says the game should go. It, to me, it still looks like white has a lot of heat here, but black is up a piece, and evidently, after the move queen to d6, that black can defend himself. Hi, I'm Peter Giannatos, founder of the Charlotte Chess Center. If you enjoyed these videos, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you'd like to watch these videos live, be sure to follow us on Twitch.